at Carleton University. And before introducing tonight's speaker, we would like to recognize our sponsors, Aris Craft International and General Shell Brick for sponsoring tonight's lecture, dedicated to stone brick and marble innovation and production, together with General Shell Brick and Aris Craft International provide exceptional exterior building materials throughout North America. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you tonight's accomplished speaker, Jack Diamond. Architect Jack Diamond graduated from the University of Cape Town, Pennsylvania and Oxford. Is the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada gold medalist and honorary fellow of the American Institute of Architects. He has received honorary doctorates from the University of Toronto and Daltec, Nova Scotia. He is a member of the Order of Ontario and an officer of the Order of Canada. He is founder of Diamond and Smith Architects Incorporated, which has received numerous national and international awards for design and sustainability. The firm has a global practice currently with projects in seven countries. A recent publication on the firm's work, Insight and Onsight, received this notice in the National Post. A hugely refreshing, treat refreshing treatise, an uplifting clarion call for architecture and cities that harness minimal materials and maximum usefulness. Lecture tours include those of Australia, the United Kingdom, Italy, South Africa, and New Zealand. His athletic career, while less well known, is no less notable. He has been a member of the Cape Town and Oxford University rugby teams and toured Europe with a South African side. During the course of his rugby, rugby career, he has played in international matches against France, Wales, and Australia. And he always took his sketchbook along. So among the projects on which Jack Diamond is currently working, are concert halls for Montreal and Denver, a new opera house for the Marinsky Theater in St. Petersburg, Russia, two hospitals in Toronto, a community center in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, and a house in Zurich, Switzerland. A book of Jack Diamond's paintings, drawings, and narrative sketches is to be published this fall by Douglas and McIntyre. And now, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you tonight's distinguished internationally renowned architect Jack Diamond and his lecture titled The Resolution of Content and Context. Thank you for that welcome. Um, that mixture of uh, CV doesn't, doesn't always, or hasn't always, uh, stood me in good stead. Uh, among architects, a jock is highly suspect. And among jocks, um, my masculinity was quite uh, often challenged when I took out my watercolor book. Um, there are several themes I want to talk about tonight. And I think they are relevant for the times, and it's a necessary correction, I think, in the direction that architecture is going. The first point I want to make is that architecture is inevitably an expression of its time. You can't escape it, and I'm going to give you some examples of that. I want to talk about a response to context before there was the mechanical systems that now we can use to counteract the environment. I want to talk about technology as a driver of design. And I want to talk about a time now when the World Wildlife Federation has calculated that currently the globe is absorbing or using or consuming one and a half times the globe's production in raw materials, which clearly is unsustainable. And if we continue this way, Within a decade or two, we'll be consuming twice what the world produces, which means it's not being replenished. And we as professionals have a duty and an obligation to deal with these aspects. I think that's what distinguishes a profession from business. It has an ethical context. Not that all businesses don't, 
But our primary question is having an ethical context is what drives us. And I really want to talk about, obviously, something which has always interested me, the shaping of the city. The picture up on the, on the screen is a demonstration clearly of the power of the pharaohs. The hovels of the fellahin we were, were hardly recognized and in fact haven't, haven't really retained uh, the, uh, the, the times, have not, they've not been sustained, they hardly exist, but these, the durability of this, the power of that, the overpowering architecture of the pyramid versus the remainder is clearly a demonstration of that extraordinary hierarchy. Second slide is, of course, during the period probably from about the 11th to the 16th century, how powerful the church was. Look at the top right hand one, the tiny picture. You see the church re re its relationship to the city around it. Its power is unmistakable and its expression is clear. In the 20th century, it's the banks. The banks dominated the, la the landscape. It's, un it's also inescapable where the power lies or lay. What about our own time? What do you make of this? What I make of it is excessive individualism. It's what lie, lie, lies behind, in my view, the ultimate consequences in the banks of greed, of extraordinary um, bonuses, of uh, people who think that just the individual gain is more important than the common good. And buildings such as these demonstrate exactly that. They're funny, they're uh, in, in, in a peculiar way, but they pay no attention at all to the collective. They're excessively individualistic. I think that this time uh, the banks have demonstrated how bad that is, the economic collapse of the 89 uh, 91 was minor in comparison to what's happened now. And I think that that correction of now recognizing that we need systemic controls on finance, we have to uh, limit the excesses of individualism in banking and in the financial world. And I think it's time that architects recognized that there is a common good, not simply individual gain, that is important, and I think the architecture should follow from that. The second point that I wanted to make to you, as I said, is about architecture that was done uh, in, in uh, regional and in um, very simple circumstance without much at hand, but the response is so exceptional. This is in a hot, wet climate where the diurnal change is very small and so you want to capture every breeze, but you have to protect yourself against the huge amounts of rain. And probably in very hot, wet climates, you have all kinds of vermin and nasty things that creep and crawl at the night. So here's a building on stilts with a heavy thatched roof made from palm and open so it catches the breeze. It's a phenomenal re it's a response with local materials to a context that's perfect. The exact opposite in the desert where the diurnal range and temperature is huge, extremely hot in the day, very cold at night. And the response is to use the local materials, mud, sand, mud bricks, very thick walls and tiny windows, preventing against glare. Those walls heat up very slowly during the day, keeping cool, and lose their heat very slowly at night. There is a wonderful time lag, the opposite of the stick, or where there's little temperature change, and that the re response is immediate to the, to the breeze. Here you want to do something the exact opposite. And Adobe <coughs> Indians developed this ex extraordinary response to architecture, and we admire the power and simplicity and directness of the way in which it works. What about our time? <clears throat> this is a, it's a slide of an engineering piece of work that's simply a brace against a wall. The principle obviously is accepting the lateral thrust against something that will stop that thrust. I just use that as an example to show you how 
the third point I want to make of using technology to drive design. The very first churches had huge thick walls. The Norman churches had walls 10, 15, sometimes 20 feet thick. That's costly and expensive to build, takes time to do it. Gradually, you put a prop against the wall as a buttress, and then you celebrate it. So what you end up with is an architecture like the Notre Dame, that's a little model of it, but the building becomes an essay, a celebration of a technology. What makes the Gothic cathedral is not some architect with a preconceived idea or sketching with a felt pen on a napkin, as has famously been done, but comes about empirically. We have the means now to accelerate empiricism because of the power of the computer and its calculation. Not to be done in an artistic way or with, with uh, algorithms to create space, shapes that are whimsical, but to work out how little material to use. What is happening here is that the 20-foot thick wall has become a delicate wall propped up with extraordinary technology. It's simply a thrusting uh, brace against a wall. And where does the rose window go? It's not painted on a drawing as a graphic. And then you squint and say a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, and add another one here. It's between the buttresses. There's no moving it. And the best thing you can do with masonry to reduce the, the, the weight is to use glass. So those wonderful rose windows also have a function in reducing the weight of the wall. So I think that this is a wonderful and beautiful example of technology becoming the design and the expression of the building in a wholly integrated way. Looking to nature to see how wonderful we can do much with little, look at that tree and its cantilever. Look at the spider web. In fact, now science has shown that some of those threads, uh, in terms of their ratio of thickness, are better than the most high tensile steels. But in fact, it is the most delicate, least material for the poor spider having to work this web to actually make it, uh, keep it alive by catching insects in it. But look how delicate that is. Or a sea anemone, where the even more elegant than a geodesic dome, done naturally. I have to tell you that the most fascinating exam I ever had to write was to gain entry to a famous engineer's course called a French art engineer of amazing genius, uh, Le Ricolet, Robert Le Ricolet. And the way you got into his class, you walked into the room, the exam room, and there was a human skeleton hanging from the scale. And this human skeleton, as you know, is the bones are wired together to keep it in one, in one piece. <clears throat> and he would say to us, the exam question was, what do you see? That was the exam question. What he wanted to hear was, look at the scale. I've forgotten the exact amount, 9, 10, or 11 pounds the bones weighed. The bones were supporting anywhere between 125 and 300 pounds of weight. If you looked at the bones themselves, they were shaped so at the joints where there was pressure, it was thickening, slender where it didn't need its weight, and shaped to protect organs such as the ribs. So the bone structure here had an economy of amazing, our bone structure has an economy of amazing dimensions. I don't know what the ratio of safety factor is, but I imagine it's very small. And that the little clips of steel holding it together demonstrated something else, that the skeleton's very bad in tension, very good in compression. So our muscle and skin actually provides the tensile strength to this uh, wonderfully compressive component. In contemporary terms, the closest anyone's got to this in reducing the amount of material to enclose a large amount of space 
is the uh, geodesic dome, not that dissimilar from the sea anemone I showed you. <clears throat> but it is a marvel of delicacy in the least amount of material. Compare it to this. Uh, 12 times the amount of steel, um, enclosing spaces that were intended for exhibition, but curators find difficult to use. Done all with a felt pen on the back of, an, of a, famously on the back of an envelope or a, a napkin, and the consequences are clear. It has little to do with urbanity. It's highly individualistic in one respect, except that's my phone. I can't believe that. <laughs> Guess where I am? <laughs> Hi, my darling. I, I'm in the middle of a lecture, and I'm going to have to hang up. Sorry about that. Bye. It's my daughter. Um, <laughs> uh, where was I? Uh, so the whole point about this individualism is in a way it's individualistic, accepting that it's the same damn thing in Germany, in Canada, in Denver. And it's a, it reminds me of the apocryphal story about Mies van der Rohe. A student um, provocatively said to him, Mr. van der Rohe, how would you design in the desert? with steel and glass. How would you design in the Arctic with steel and glass? But uh, isn't there a difference? Yeah, a question of proportion. Well, it isn't a question of proportion. It's a question of context. And it is a question of economy. I don't mean just dollars and cents. I mean real economies, using as little as you can to greatest effect. So that's the, the thesis and the background. I thought. Now the tough part is for you to show you some of my work, and you can judge whether we have dealt with context or not. Um, this is a, a drawing or a sketch of the, um, dome of the, the Dome of the Rock. And instead of building a major building all on its own, we restored uh, 11 of the 12 buildings on the site and developed a plan that replicated really this souk, so that the, this is on the ridge that was once a crusader route into the city, and uh, with a building that you went through between spaces, then arrived at a plaza, the main building, and all the way through. The problem in Jerusalem, where this is, is that it has terrible divides. And so it was my view that uh, our job was to make it possible for both Arab and Jew to come together in a municipal building. But one of the problems, and I would say that one of the interesting things in architecture, well, for the, first of all, one of the simple things is to take one aspect of a problem and solve it massively, which is very much what so-called iconic buildings do. They create a statement for real estate. They are... Um, add to the um, fame of the architect because it's so recognizable. And it, of course, it appeals. It has 15 minutes of fame uh, and doesn't necessarily solve many of the other problems. The question is, when you have opposing requirements, how do you resolve those opposing requirements? Here's a classic case of that. On the one hand, we needed to make this square as permeable as possible from east and west. And yet, as we all know from urban design uh, principles, we need to make a square that has a definition and enclosure. So the device that we used was at this end was to in fact plug the end with a grove of palm trees and that end with a band shell and some walkway up a slope so that the edge was defined. Here, not very new idea, a hanging garden. And then contrasting the formal plaza with the informality of the gardens around, and that all of these buildings became part of the municipal services, different departments and small buildings, breaking the scale down, but also making a campus rather than a monumental building. Um, but those are the components of the, the souk, uh, the cotton souk, the experience of work, walking through enclosed spaces out into bright sunlight all coming from one end all the way down to the Jaffa Gate, 
So it was on that axis that we planned the building. And then arrival finally at the hall. This, this is now well grown with wisteria and the plumbago, but de defining the space. And as you know, you can make a door welcoming or you can make it very unwelcoming. You put the door flush or proud of the face and if you put big knobs on it, big bosses and heavy components, it's a handoff. If you, if you make the door recessive, provide shade in a hot climate or shelter from the wind and rain in a northern climate, it's a welcoming gesture. So here it was clearly intended as a welcoming gesture at the end of the axis that replicated the city. The second problem of a similar kind was to, in fact, reconcile two opposing forces. In this case, it was the foreign ministry, a competition we won, an international competition. Both of those actually were international competitions. But here we had the Supreme Court, the um, Knesset, the parliament buildings, and this is the national boulevard or national, around the national precinct with these precious buildings with the bureaucracy forming or trying to form the enclosure and definition to that space. But the building that we were about to be building here, designing that we were about to build, while it had to be part of the aggregate, it also had to be very much an expression of the importance of foreign affairs, which in Israel, it's domestic affairs are foreign affairs. It's of huge importance. So that was one of the conflicts that we had to resolve, the opposing requirements. The second one was it's a democratic country, contrary to much of the opposition press. The fact of the matter is that it had to be the most secure building in the country, and that's saying something. So unlike the American embassies, which appear to be fortresses, this was intended not to be. So the, 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 the devices used was that on the one hand, the continuity of this element formed one geometry in order to provide the continuity. And then opposing layers, in fact, were designed to give it individuality that were not part of that geometry. And again, to create a very, very calm center. There was a third, I guess, a third conflicting requirement. We first designed it so that the uh, diplomats and so forth would enter from one end and foreign ministers and the foreign minister at the other. And they said, no, 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 you can't do that. It's a democratic country. Everybody has to come through the same door. And I said, well, what happens if you've got the foreign minister visiting from Germany or France and all your clerks are coming at the same time? They said, that's your problem. So what we did was with the sloping land, everybody comes into this space. Some come in at a different level, but that is the entry hall. Others come into this secure court. Uh, of course, they're very peculiar things you've got to design there. We'd never had to design garbage boxes before that were bombproof. It's not something you do in Canada very often. Um, we had to design a uh, situation room that was resistant to atomic attack, or people could live there for two weeks, and so forth. So, but different things, but the normal architectural problems of how to, in fact, create a complex of these pieces and make it feel welcoming. By and large, it was done by the earthwork. But here is the example of how the one geometry, that is the continuity of the wall enclosure in contrast to the other geometry, and obviously sun shading, very important. This is the entry to this very delicate piece in the center. Those onyx walls, I might say, everything that's not a usual assemblage is tested in a bomb site in the desert. And the first time we did it, uh, was a total failure. We would have, I think, annihilated the, the diplomatic corps with that design. But the second one, this one here, was tested and worked. And the way we did it was, you know when a cannon fires, it recoils. You give it the space to recoil from a shot. Every panel here has a small clip inside that accepts blast and falls outwards. So, and then there's the, just the use of 
local stones and sun shading devices that make it all part of that context. And a very different context is working in the Caribbean in a tropical context with a very difficult site. But picking up on the wonderful architecture of the colonial period before air conditioning, principle of great roofs to give shade and protect against the storms. There's no groundwater, so you collect all the water off that and provide for breeze and double roofs that keep you cool. And the whole procedure of taking away the view from people as you come down the hill, you first show them where everything is, then you hide it from them, then you come through to create interest. It's interesting to me that the sort of anomaly of San Francisco, one of the satisfying things about San Francisco is that it does the opposite of what good planning should have done in some sense but it would have been a bad thing to do. You would say, well, you should really design roads that are slow on the contour, where they just lay the grid right over this extraordinary topography. The benefit of it is as you come over the hill or these crazy streets, you see the whole city, you know where you are. Giving place to, position, to, to the individual is a hugely satisfying thing whether you're planning an individual building or you're designing a neighborhood or a city that sense of place, of a grammar of visual grammar of direction is a wonderful thing to do, but you can also play with it. So that here, these confluence of these stairs brings you to the spot where you suddenly see right through the building to the, the, the beyond. And we invented this bifold, vertical bifold door that slides on a neoprene screen. So it can be an enclosed room or an open one, but there's no glass. And the views beyond it are quite superb. That's the view when you look through the building. And other ones of this kind, of the still a different circumstance, a very windy site, more wind than you want to create a very still interior as a calming alternative to the wind. So, two uh, Canadian examples of a building that has to be, again, part of the city and yet more special. So on University Avenue, uh, this is the special part. The rest are a series of orthogonal blocks that line the street as ordinary buildings do, that create street continuity, that create sidewalks that have life to them, that pay attention to the vernacular of the town. But the transparency here has become hugely important. The success rate of the Opera House, uh, not by my standard, but by the standard of Opera Houses in North America is quite astonishing. They have a 96% occupancy. The average age of the opera goer is dropping year over year. And I attribute it to a couple of things. First of all, when watching this or driving by, it's not a mystery. Things that are mysterious are always slightly scary but it's so transparent, obviously, you see people in jeans going to the opera. There are 90 free concerts given in this aerial amphitheater we designed, this idea we had where you can have a drink, but a pre-performance talks, and at 10 o'clock on a freezing winter's day, they line up for a noon concert. And the idea here was, I'd watched on the TD Bank lawn, people with their brown bag lunches during the summer listening to a jazz band. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to have a place in winter where that could occur? So this is what we dubbed the city room, accomplishes just that. Um, but the contrast between the orthogonal enclosure, the sort of rough, tough, uh, external, is in contrast to the curvilinear center, which is acoustically, of course, isolated from the rest, and most importantly, from the social dynamic I think of students and architects, think of the social dynamic as a design driver. You go a long way to solving, and sat not for yourself, but satisfying for the user. The idea here is that a very old idea, an Italian idea, as you might imagine, as opposed to the German idea of straight like this room. In this room, you're conscious of the few people around you, but not of the audience as a whole. What happens here is that you can look across 
you feel like it's an occasion because it's a gregarious event. There's, a, there's an aspect of the collective, and for the performer, the closeness of the embrace of the audience is very important, and the intimacy between here and there is equally important. So that tried and true shape of the Italian opera, we try to give a contemporary expression to. But that transparency on the outside is of enormous importance. And bringing light into it, because you know, uh, buildings with big windows aren't necessarily transparent if the light outside is stronger than the light inside. That's why you can look into a building at night, not during the day. Windows aren't transparent during the day. So we brought natural light to light the room so you would see into it. And this staircase, again, it's show business slightly. Uh, it's the longest glass staircase in the world. And its structure is simple. All of you here know what an I-beam is. And you know the strength of the I-beam is in the top and bottom flanges. The web is just keeping them apart. Well, that's the top flange. That's the bottom flange. And the glass balustrade is the web. And so we pin the glass steps to this virtual I-beam. And so it has fun. It's a play of staircases. The movement of people on staircases and through levels, the spatial kinetic. I can't emphasize this enough. That's why you can't simply take pictures of buildings. You have to move through them. And that's one of the things that I thought about iconic architecture. It's designed for pictures. It's designed for the cover of a magazine. It's not designed as an experience. The experiential quality of going through big spaces, small spaces, low ceilings, high ceilings, the view you give people as they move through the building, take it away, put it in front of them. The experiential question is the ultimate success. And to boast you for a second, if I might, there's yet to be a, excuse me, there's yet to be a performance that I go to quite regularly at the Opera House. And it's the only time it's really happened to me in this way. People come up to me and say, thank you. We love the building. We love being here. It feels comfortable like our living room. All kinds of comfortable things that they enjoy simply being there. And of course, one of the tricks is that during the performance, the singers, the musicians are the performers. But during the intermission, the audience are the performers. They're walking around, seen and be seen. It's a way in which they are having a party, otherwise stay at home, watch it on DVD. A similar project that we did in Washington, D.C., to give it distinction but retain the continuity of the street was to create a great bay window of the structural glass within an office building to create the Shakespeare Theater, <clears throat> which you also incidentally get spectacular views up and down the city. L'Enfant designed this city to have these closed vistas with the Treasury Building or the White House or whatever. <clears throat> but as the city has grown up with all its paraphernalia along the streets, these vistas have disappeared. Up one level, though, you get them once again. So those are the ways in which that works. Very different context is a winery in Niagara. These are competitive commercial enterprises. And clearly, we wanted to establish something in the landscape that went with the rows of the vines, made it an organic one, so that the water off the parking lot washed through reed beds to purify the toxicity of water that comes off automobiles before going into the, into the general irrigation system, and established a line that was visible from this road with a floating piece uh, that's it, sitting in the landscape. You can see the reed beds and the floating roof that this sits in the landscape. Um, it has a very long and low profile, as you can see. Minimalist in its material use, expression. Very carefully designed so that it has as little to do, in a sense, with the details of the winery itself, which is uh, visible when you get into it. Finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about shaping space. We all know this beautiful one of the collective in Bath at the Royal Crescent, shaping the space. 
And working in St. Petersburg, we've got the similar circumstance to deal with. It is the most extraordinary city. Um, I recommend it to every student to visit. It's, a, it's an amazing, not only is it consistent, but it is continuous over a very wide area. And the elements of it are these. Essentially, they are plaster buildings relieved occasionally with these colonnaded porticos and metal roofs. Those are the elements of the architecture of St. Petersburg, relieved, obviously, by very exceptional buildings, like the Kazan in this case, um, or in this case, this onion dome. But there it is, there's the, the, the plaster building, the metal roof, the relief of the colonnade, and its continuity, and then occasionally that extraordinary building like that. So, to me, the enclosure of the square, you note that the corners are closed, and that it's a legitimate to design a building of out of context. The more different it is, the better it is in, con in contrast to the continuity of the street. This is wrong. This breaking this up is dead wrong. That's what Frank Lloyd Wright did. It's a very bad piece of urban design. It may be an extraordinary piece of architecture, although from, a, from an art exhibition point of view, it has its problems. But its, it's real crime is the destruction or the beginnings of the destruction of the city. He was an anti-urbanist. So that's the, this is the Kazan in St. Petersburg. That is the um, Frank Lloyd Wright Guggenheim in New York. But this, you can see the enclosure, the regularity, and then this ex exceptional building. So what we have in St. Petersburg and with the Mariinsky is the same issue of the foreign ministry in Jerusalem in the sense that we, this is the existing Mariinsky. That's the conservatory of music. And this is our site, and that's a canal. It's, I mean, it's quite Venice-like in many respects. In fact, the soil conditions are so bad, <laughs> you really are, in a sense, have to float the building. So our urban design idea was, in fact, to create a plaza which does not exist. This exists. Some of that exists. This is a parking lot. We wanted to have this read of the two historical components, and we deliberately play this down, not as another iconic building standing on its own in an unjustified manner, regardless of the fact that it's an opera house. It's part of the street continuity to create what will be, I think, one of the premier cultural complexes in the world. And of course, it's so thrilling to work with, I mean, next to architecture, music is my love. And so to work with something that, where Rimsky-Korsakov, Tchaikovsky, Glinka, and so many others have been the principal conductors and worked on this, both at the conservatory and at the opera house, we're doing a whole block. Now, the reason it's so big, this has very poor production facilities, the historic Mariinsky. So we're building here with a bridge connection, the production facilities for two houses. Let me give you an example of how big, a, what's great about going to the opera there too. You get uh, teenagers going out on dates and uh, beautiful looking young people going to the opera on a date instead of going to the movies. Um, this, th there's a cultural difference that's quite marked and quite remarkable. So what we said from the design point of view, that's the tradition. Vertical windows punctuating a masonry base, metal ceiling, and a portico. We felt that we could give a contemporary expression to it. The roof could be quite exceptional. This should be quite unexceptional and the relief could be in structural glass bays. So that's our answer. Here's the traditional Mariensky, the old one, historic one. This is the new one with a wonderful views of the skyline. Remembering in June in St. Petersburg, the sun doesn't set. So after the performance, you can come out onto a terrace and see the whole city and these great bays being able to look back at the historic Mariensky with this, that's the, the oval, or the horseshoe. 
huge. They have the luxury of all of these performance um, uh, rehearsal spaces. Uh, in Toronto, I think there may be 60 or 70 performances a year. The Mariansky gives 600. They have 2,500 employees, 12 prima ballerinas, and six conductors. Uh, they tour the world. Obviously, 600 performances are done because of two or three companies. But it is a large industry. It's a very exceptional industry. And uh, you get a sense of it from these. These are very early and preliminary pictures of the interior design. Um, view from the ground. Uh, some of the interiors, it's, these are very early shots. I think they have improved since then. But that's the view from the bay window across the canal to the Mariensky. And we're creating an extension of that plaza that I mentioned early on to create an entrance as a continued continuity of the space in front of the historic building. And these magnificent views from the roof of the Mariensky, uh, that's the Kazan. Oh, no, that's St. Isaac's. I'm sorry, St. Isaac's, uh, Nikolai, and so on. Um, and some early design uh, studies of the facade. And it's not that different now. And it's under construction. <clears throat> so I want to, uh, you can see that the play of the staircase here and the spaces once more, it's an important element with the expression of the drum of the building remaining, an important uh, identifying element. <clears throat> so we're going to skip that. But uh, here's the site. We're working on the foundations. That's the historic building. Here's what I want to unify. And we will line that facade as the rest of the city does, being really careful to deal with that context. And the final slide I want to show you is also under construction. It's a competition we won for the new uh, concert hall in Montreal. That's an uh, elevation at the side. And then finally, if it works, if it works, no, it's not working. Um, we have a little video, which I'm sure think you might be interested simply from the video point of view. Thank you. It was working, yeah. It's a traditional shoebox uh, concert hall, one of the best forms for this kind of symphonic music. The distinction between a concert hall, a theater, and an opera house is that a concert hall is one room. A theater is two rooms, the stage and the auditorium, and an opera house is three, stage, pit, and auditorium. Very important distinctions between the three prototypes. And so this is very much the shoebox, but it does have the audience all around it. This was a placekeeper for the organ, which much is too much like a radiator. We now have a wonderful free form uh, developed with Casavan, a company of wonderful organ builders in Quebec. It's a nice abstraction right across the end of this room. And again, these are some early schematics that we put into a video for the client to really understand the spaces that they were getting. So that's the conclusion of my talk tonight, and thank you for listening for so long. Thank you. If you don't mind, maybe we ask the audience if they have. Sure. If you, uh, my voice, if it holds up, um, I'd be happy to take questions. 
Nobody wants to ask the first question. Who'd like to ask the second question? And the, the two microphones are on the two sides, so if you like. Yeah. Uh, I'm probably going on too long. Yes, sir. Just from my interpretation of your expression about the whole rather than the individualism. Yes. Are we not all individuals yes. before anything else? Well, we're individuals, of course, but we can't for nothing if we act alone. It's community that has to be balanced with individual. Obviously, it's a balancing act. Okay. And I think that the pendulum has swung far too much toward the individual and not to the collective, not to the community, not to the aggregate. It's the aggregate. One of the things that I discovered about Toronto when I first went there, and I thought I'd made the biggest mistake in my life. It was a boring Presbyterian city uh, of no architectural distinction whatsoever. But gradually what I realized is that it had an amazing urban continuity, that its collective was more important than the individual building. But what happened is in Toronto is, is instructive. It's a rigid grid. The only buildings that break the grid are public institutions. They're given pride of place, whether they've got good or bad architecture. You think about Queen's Park at the head of uh, University Avenue, or Osgoode Hall at the head of York Street, or the Old City Hall at the head of Bay Street. Those are given pride of place. So there is an individualism about that that is an accord to the reverence for the institution that Canadians have, which I think is hugely admirable. But the collective of the streets, unlike, take the contrast of Houston. There is no continuity. Buildings are surrounded by parking lots, high-rise buildings with seas of blacktop around them. No community sense at all, no collective. It's all individual buildings, each one trying hard to outdo the other in its attractiveness for real estate purposes. But in terms of, and I, when I've been there, you don't walk the street after five o'clock at night. It's dangerous. It's genuinely dangerous because there's no protection. There's nobody there. For example, it, to me at least, that of course we're individuals, it's individuals, but it's the individuals as a group that create a culture, not on your own. If you're going to argue with that, I can see. But the a priori is the individuals joining together. Mm -hmm. If it was ad infinitum of the same, it would be blasé, it would be nothing. Well, the, I mean, I think that you can, you can put words like that and you can obviously shade it with that kind of a pejorative statement. But the fact of the matter is that the difference between um, a kind of uh, the boredom of a barracks and the elegance of a royal crescent is clearly in the detail. But whether it's elegant or whether it's banal, it seems to me that it's the collective that makes up the city, not the individual building. Except with some, as I said in Toronto's case, which is carefully calibrated to give precedence to public institutions, which I admire hugely. I mean, I remember the battle for Old City Hall. Eaton's wanted to buy it place there, there was an enormous, not from architects, public outcry. People sense that you don't give a private company that kind of privileged location. Young Street, all those other streets, they're extraordinary. I mean, if you watch Young Street, which is sort of shabby and down at the heels, is thronged with people. Why? It's got continuity. There's an absolute sense of community about it. Anyway. Maybe. Yes, sir. You started out with a reference to a future of scarcity. Yes. Uh, an inevitable, because we can't continue that over yes. consumption. Besides economy uh, in use of materials, yes. what other impacts do you see of that environment on architecture in the future? 
Well, I think that's already in place. I think that the whole lead system has uh, made it possible to have the most uh, simple, inexperienced contractor environmentally responsible. Before lead, we had no currency, no measuring device to say this is better than that. So now you've got a shopping list that you can tick off uh, all the things that you can do and you get registered. So I think the lead system has become quite extraordinary. Let me tell you how far it's got. Um, a, f and a firm of uh, developers who shall remain nameless came to us to say, we'd like you to do our office buildings. They do small office buildings, a couple hundred thousand square feet, on the edge of these major centers. And I said to them, you know, I I'm surprised you've come to us. I'm delighted. But you know what our fees are. We don't uh, just hand on a sketch to the contractor. We do the full thing. They said, we know that. Um, and we're prepared to pay the fee. And I said, well, tell me why you've come to us. He said this. Intelligent tenants now are saying, are you lead registered or lead silver? Because they know a lead registered building has a lower utility cost. And if you're paying the rent plus the utility costs, you want to know that. So it's become a competitive question in the commercial field to have a lead registered building. And so it's really biting. So in one respect, I think there's genuine progress. Um, if you like, look at the University of Ontario's Institute of the University of Ontario's Institute of Technology, it's the um, MIT is the UOIT of the South. Um, it's uh, it's a bit it's, uh, it's the most environmentally responsible building. And what we've done is that again, like the like the um, uh, the vineyard, the wine establishment, all the parking lots, the water is. Toxic water is taken through reed beds. We use the uh, all kinds of passive solar energy protection. Uh, we have, um, I didn't show you what we had. In fact, Pioneer, and now it's quite com reasonably common. It's a, bio, a living world, a biofilter world that purifies the air, the occupancy sensors, green roofs, collecting water off the roofs for recirculation in air conditioning systems. All of that's having an effect. And I think that if you look at the kilowatts per hour per square meter, you can look at the energy consumption of buildings. You can really calibrate them. So I think that there's genuine progress and there's been more, more to come. I'm more concerned in one respect on the material side. We all uh, berate the Brazilians for cutting down the rainforest because it'll affect us all. But we're the consumers. So we've got to stop consuming that. Sorry, I couldn't hear. He says every time he goes to Home Depot, he, he thinks of whether the, where the wood is coming from. Absolutely. Absolutely. One should be very conscious of that. And in the end, the consumer will, in, in effect, alter practices. And people in this room, the largest, cons the, the largest single industry that consumes energy are buildings, more than automobiles. So there's an enormous amount of effect I mean, we can go on about that. The, uh, I've said uh, on request from the federal government about funding cities because they say we're underfunded because we've got this peculiar structure in Canada where cities are the creature of the provinces and the province go begging to the feds and the, and the cities go begging to the provinces. And I've said don't fund them because you're funding bad habits. We did a measurement in southern Ontario of low density housing. For every dollar you got in tax return, Cost a dollar forty to service because it's too widespread. It's going you're going to go broke. So until I think the way funding of cities should occur should be to say to the city, demonstrate to us how you can. What's your motor split right now? Ninety percent private, ten percent public. Show us how you will get to a seventy thirty. We'll fund you. Show us how you will in fact improve the water consumption. Show us how you will handle your garbage. And if you can demonstrate to us, make it on a performance basis, demonstrate to us that you can improve the, 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 the garbage collection on its disposal, if you can improve the modal split, if you can improve your energy consumption, we'll fund you. That's the way money should be given. 
on a competitive basis with these standards and targets set out, then we'll get improvement. Follow the money. Probably had enough. Well, if, if I may, maybe I can ask one question myself. Yes, please. So, well, Those are the second question. <laughs> I really, of course, enjoyed uh, how you presented the question of the context and how important it is to respond um, to the site. So I wanted to ask you, how do you get in the site? How do you get a good sense of the context that makes you, you know, able? Well, and I guess you're challenged by working in a different country. And yes. Yeah. How do you um, Napoleon won his battles by walking the site. Uh, he, walked the, this, he walked the terrain very carefully and figured out how to do the battle. I think too many architects do, uh, do their battles on paper before walking the site, looking at the rainfall, the wind direction, transportation, public services, and all of those contextual questions. But there's the cultural one, like St. Petersburg. It's inescapable. I mean, it's not that difficult. You don't have to be uh, a rocket scientist to figure that out. So uh, I think that context, if you have the attitude that context is important, it'll come. Okay. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You very much. Thank you.